Good morning. Thank you very much for being with us. It's James here from the Image File Support Desk, and it's again great to have Gavin with us uh, from GavTrain talking about photo fixes. Straight over to you, Gavin. Thank you very much, James. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me again for Photo Fixes number four. Wow, four down already. This is uh, going well. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the Image File for inviting me along to do this again this morning. I, I love doing these. These are great fun. And thanks to everybody that's got involved one way or another. So, speaking of getting involved, this is a live webinar. Unless you're watching the recording, and then it's a recording. But assuming you're, you're joining me live, then uh, this is an interactive webinar as well. So if you've got any questions, if you'd like uh, something, uh, me to go back over something, then please feel free to fill in the, uh, the little question and answer box. And James is at the other end, ready to uh, gather your questions together, and we'll, we'll go through them at the end. Similarly, couldn't do this without you. So if you have a, uh, a photo you'd like fixing or a question you'd like answering, please send them along. We've got another two of these to do, so uh, we, we've still got a couple of uh, evenings, days to, to, to put this together if you have a photo you'd like fixing. Okay, so without further ado, let's crack on with our first little photo to fix. So I'll just close that one down and go find my pictures, and we're going to start with uh, these two pictures right here. It's that time time of year, weddings, yeah, we're kicking off the wedding season big time, so not surprisingly, we're going to start getting a few uh, wedding problems to come up, because if there's anything that tests your photography, it's weddings. You need to be a great photographer, that's a given, but you also need to be a brilliant person at handling people and handling crowds, and that's frankly, in my experience, um, half the, the skill, or even two-thirds of the skill of being a good wedding photographer. Anyway, let's, let's read out the, uh, the question that we had sent through. So, as always, we are keeping these anonymous, but uh, the question goes along the lines of, is there an easy way to combine these two photos so that everybody is looking at the camera with their eyes open? Okay, now, I don't do weddings anymore uh, for varying reasons, but uh, this is this is exactly my experience of weddings. This, this isn't one of those glossy, glamorous weddings that you see in, in uh, photographers' portfolios that makes you so jealous, or in, in wedding magazines. This is the real world. This is what wedding photography is really like. So let's see what we've got. We've got a, uh, a bride and groom. Uh, we've got most people, young lady not looking at the camera, young gentleman eyes closed. I would guess that's the standard look for that chap. Uh, again, looking over to mum probably. Um, bride and groom not looking too thrilled about things. Uh, yeah, group shots are great fun. They are the necessary evil of wedding photography. Uh, let's have a look at the other picture sent through. So this is the second shot. And yeah, in this one we've got the bridesmaid looking off to the side. That one's still not looking at the camera. I've only got two, so hopefully the, the photographer took a third one, because I can't do much with that young lady. Um, he's not looking at the camera now. Yep, same look. And, ah, okay, obviously the best man looking way off to the side as well. So, uh, between this, and the bride and groom looking happier in this picture, I would suggest. Between these pictures, we can make a group picture where almost everybody is looking at the camera and looking pretty happy. I'll say I used to do this almost all of the time with group shots. The minute you get a group of people, with, which is sort of three or more people, somebody's going to look away, somebody's going to blink, something's going to distract them, and it doesn't matter whether it's a wedding, it happens in my studio as well when we're doing uh, groups. So there are a few things that I do to try and minimize it. So uh, number one is to take plenty of pictures, and it looks like the photographer's done just that. So let's go and grab these two images and put them on top of each other. So let's go to Select and All. Edit and copy. I'll go back to this picture and choose edit and paste. Okay, so I've copied the, the two images together onto separate layers and I can just flick them on and off. And as you see, there are or well, there is a slight movement between the two. So number two, after taking many pictures, is take them on a tripod. Now, I'm not a big tripod fan at all when it comes to weddings. I like to be free and flowing, but when it came to group shots, I found very quickly, if I have to swap heads around, having your camera on a tripod made life a lot easier because you don't have this movement between the two shots. And although I can fix it in Photoshop, it's not going to be too hard. 
just nice to speed up uh, the, the, the workflow when you have to do a real wedding by having your images aligned. So tripods with your zoom locked so it doesn't zoom between shots just makes life a little bit easier. Okay, so how do we get these two images to line up? Well, very simply, I'm going to click on the background layer, so it becomes my active highlighted layer. Then I'm going to hold the shift key, and I'll click the layer above, so both layers are active and highlighted. Okay, and that's really important. If you don't do that step, well, let me show you what happens. If you don't do that step, you only have one layer. We're going to go to Edit, Auto Align Layers, but it's, it's grayed out. When you have both layers active and selected, it's available. Okay, so you can't really miss that step because it won't work. And the auto align layers is a brilliant little function. If you've ever made a panorama, it is the same engine that makes panoramas, stitches, images together. I'm going to use the auto projection, and that just means it does the thinking for me, which on a Wednesday morning is kind of handy, and it lines my two images up. Now you can see they're not perfectly aligned, there's some overlap, we'll need to do some cropping, but if I just flick through the two layers, have a look at that background. That background is now perfectly still, only the people are moving. Okay, and that's what you would have had had you been using a tripod, of course. Okay, that brings me on to one last problem, which is this picture at the top is darker than the picture below. In fact, if I look at this shot, this one looks like the flash went off, and the top shot looks like the flash didn't fire. So, step number three, after taking many pictures, using a tripod, is manual exposure. Now, I, I shoot aperture priority almost exclusively when I'm doing an event like this, it would be aperture priority, but assuming it's the kind of weather where the lighting doesn't change, if you shoot in manual, it makes blending images together, swapping heads around, again, that little bit easier. Remember, if the lighting isn't changing, your exposure shouldn't change. Easy to say after the event, I know. So let's just see if we can fix this slightly dark image by going up to image adjustment and levels. And here on the levels, let's see if we can just bring up the, the sort of the general exposure, just a little bit more in the whites maybe as well. Okay, something like that. And we'll flick between the two. Yeah, that looks pretty close. Well, that was lucky. Um, yeah, that that no, I'm not lucky. What's the other word? That was skillful. That's what it is. Pure skill that. <laughs> Uh, so that gets my exposures about right, everything's lined up, let's get on with the head swapping. Now I'm going to use this image as my main image because the bride and the groom, particularly the bride, is smiling. Uh, the one below, she's not, and as we all know as wedding photographers, the number one person you need to please is the bride, followed by the bride's mother in that order. So let's keep the bride smiling picture and we'll just move heads around for the groom and the bridesmaid and a couple of others there as well. So this, I think, will be my least work. Now, I'm going to put a layer mask on here, so we'll go to layer, layer mask, reveal all. On my layers, what you see is a little white layer mask just to the right of the layer. Now, layer masks are great because they allow you to have a, a get out of jail free. So they work by using paintbrushes. If I get black as my, my paintbrush color and I start painting, you see, I am effectively erasing through the image, but if I swap to white, I can paint it back in again. So it works just like the eraser tool, except you can go backwards in time, and that's a good thing. Okay, let's start with the, the groom, not the groom, the, the bride, uh, best man. See, that's how long it is since I've done weddings. The best man. He's obviously looking over to the side. I've got black as my paintbrush color. I can just paint in the head from the layer below, where he's actually looking at the camera. Okay, and that is quite handy because he's moved his head, but he hasn't moved his shoulders, which is really lucky. Thank you very much, photographer, for sending me this one. They can be much harder than this sometimes, uh, but that one's nice and straightforward. Okay, who next? Uh, looking at the camera, looking at the camera, eyes open. As I say, I think that's a fixed pose. <laughs> okay, this young lad down here. Let me just toggle off the, the layer. So we can see, yep, the layer below, he's definitely looking happier and looking at the camera. This one, he's just looking off to the side. It's not a biggie, but we can fix it. So again, I'll use my paintbrush, and I'll just paint with a little bit of black just over there, and that will reveal the layer below. Now, I can't just do his eyes, because if I do, then his, his face looks wrong. The proportions look wrong. Sometimes you can get in 
and just paint the eyes away. But in this case, I'm going to have to do the whole head. And this is where it starts to become a little bit more tricky, because if you think, well, if I do that bit, I might have to do his shoulder, but then the arm from the layer below where the chap behind has moved has come in. And you have to make a few decisions. I'll paint it out with white. And you have to just take a little step back and say, well, does that look about right? Yes, I think it does. OK, I'm happy with that. OK, that's fine. Um, we don't have one for this little lady, so I can't do much with her eyes. But the, the bridesmaid off to the side, yeah, again, I can just flick this on and off. Lower layer, she's looking at the camera. Upper layer, she's looking off to her friends at the side. So again, we'll just use the black paintbrush. And this time, I might be able to get away with just the eyes. I might. Let's do the rest of her head as well. Let's just pop in her hair. And it's when you start doing this, you kind of realize how different everybody's face is, how face shapes are all different and things can really work well sometimes on one face and you do the same technique on another and it doesn't work quite so well. But in this case, I think that looks about right. So quick review, everybody looking at the camera, yes. Everybody smiling, yes. Fantastic. That just leaves us those little areas around the outside. Just need the crop tool. We'll get the crop tool and we'll crop in just like that. And there we go. Job done. We go from a picture where people are kind of not looking at the camera through to where they are, or we can do the other way and just go, there we go. We can, we can make the guy's head turn, which is kind of fun. Uh, so hopefully that answers the photographer's question. Um, to a degree, yes, you can combine the, the two images together. Is there an easy way? Yes, but it really does make a massive difference if you uh, get a few things right at the beginning. Obviously, if you can develop your photographer's voice, where you become big and booming and you get everybody's attention, that's the way to go about doing group shots, if possible. If not, yep, Photoshop can definitely help. OK, so that's one image done. Let's close those down. And we'll jump into the, the next one. Uh, yeah, it's definitely a wedding theme going on. I'm definitely noticing a few weddings. Do we have some weddings over Easter by chance? Um, so we've got another one here from a wedding theme and sent in. The question says, uh, I was shooting inside with my camera set to tungsten white balance, but my cake photo is blue. Help. <laughs> it is a little blue, isn't it? Uh, this is one of the joys of shooting with a fixed white balance. And it can be a problem. And I've stumbled into this trap myself, particularly at weddings, where your, your mind's racing at 1,000 miles an hour trying to think of everything and get everything done. And sometimes the small things slip you by. For example, in this case, it may be that you were shooting indoors tungsten. You moved over to the cake that was possibly by the window. So the lighting on here is more daylight than tungsten light. That's my, my best guess. I'm going to you know, do the photographer a favor and say, that's what happened. I don't know. So I've only got the JPEG of this. Had you been shooting in RAW, this wouldn't be a problem at all. Uh, if, you, if you use Lightroom to edit your pictures, this would be so much easier because Lightroom edits the same way on a JPEG as a RAW file when it comes to white balance, at least. Uh, but we can fix it in Photoshop reasonably easily. Now, there's a couple of ways we could do this. Let's start with the, the classic of going into, say, color balance and just seeing if we can tweak the color balance just to get this sort of right. Okay, So, I mean, that actually doesn't look too bad, although the color on these delightful, classy cake toppers um, are, are a little bit off. So uh, that's better than it was but we can do better. Okay? We can do better in possibly even less time than it took to do that. So that's got to be good. The way to do better is to get this image into Adobe Camera Raw. Now, if you're in Lightroom, you're already in it. That, that's kind of, if you're a Lightroom worker, you're in Adobe Camera Raw effectively already. If you're a Photoshop worker or an Elements worker, then you need to get this into Raw. And there's a couple of ways you might want to do that. Let's start with the, the older way, if you have anything prior to Photoshop CC, you would go to File, Open As, and on Open As, you'd navigate to your image, wherever it might be, click on it, and then change the, the format here to Camera Raw. Okay, so whatever it says, whether it normally says Photoshop by default, change it to Camera Raw, 
and click open and then Photoshop or Elements will treat your JPEG or your TIFF or whatever format it is as if it was a raw file and bring it into Camera Raw. Okay? It really is a JPEG. You can see up in the corner here it says JPEG. Okay, so that's how you do it in previous versions. If you're on the Photoshop CC, then there is a very, very nice feature that I just love, and it's the fact that you can go to Filter, and you can bring any layer or any file into Camera Raw from the Filter menu. Brilliant. That's just much, much easier. Okay, so once you're in here, there's a few things you could do. Now, being a JPEG, I don't have the custom presets that you would associate with a RAW file, so there is no daylight or white balance in there. Uh, I could tweak the temperature and then the tint maybe a little bit, and you see that's already, in my book, that's better than the, the color balance inside of Photoshop. Uh, but we could also try the auto option, which is about the same. That was a bit of luck. Uh, or we could do it using the white balance tool right here. Now, Lightroom has a huge white balance tool. The, the Photoshop and Elements version, it's much smaller, and don't muddle it up with the color sampler tool, which looks pretty much identical. The white balance tool, really simple. All you need to find is something in your picture that's white or gray. Now, if you're shooting weddings, boy, are you in luck, because by and large, most weddings I've ever shot have got somebody either wearing white or gray, or failing that, they've got a very gray sky, but that was just my luck. Uh, I always seem to get gray sky, great for photography, nice overcast lighting, but not so good for happy brides and grooms. Okay, so with the white balance tool, something white, for example, the dress of our little cake topper here, uh, I can click on that, and that will reset the white balance around what I've just clicked on, and that is probably the correct color. Okay, we've got some beautiful warm tones. It's a long way from where we started, but you can see we've got different tones here on his waistcoat and what have you. We could click on the hat, that might be gray, or it might be a bluish gray, uh, but what the correct color is, kind of up to you. Actually, I've just spotted, there's this little white heart there. Maybe we could try that. Yeah. So you're just looking in parts of your picture that are a neutral color, and you click around until you find one that you feel is correct. Okay, and just to show you where we came in, uh, I can do a side by side now in RAW, that's handy. One of the new features of Photoshop CC. It's been in Lightroom forever, so <laughs> nice to catch up. Uh, but there we go, that's what came in, and there's my color corrected alternative. Okay, so hopefully that answers the photographer's question there and, and helps them out a little bit. Let's move on with the next one. Uh, right, yes. Now, this one uh, sent in. This, this one uh, really caught my eye when it came in. Um, okay. <laughs> I've lost my track of where I was. Oh, here we go. No, I tell a lie. I've completely lost my track. Bear with me a second. No, it is that one. Did I mention this was live? <laughs> okay, so, uh, question is, and it's a really short one, any advice would be grateful. That's pretty much what the, the email said. Any advice would be grateful. I've got no more information about this one other than uh, this was the best the photographer could do with the starting file. Any advice would be grateful. Um, let me show you the start file. That's the start file. Yep, your screens haven't broken. That is what I'm starting with. Now, I never like to tell a photographer there's a time to give in, but really there are times when that might be a very wise idea. This image, when I first saw it, I honestly thought, well, there's, there's probably not much I can do to it because it is so really dark. Then, then I start to think, hang on a minute, that, that's not necessarily particularly helpful because we've all had scenarios like this where something horrible has gone wrong, the best thing you can do on a scenario like this is learn what went wrong, why it went wrong, and what you can do to make it not happen again. Not only that, this picture could be the most important picture you've taken. Maybe it's not a commercial picture, but maybe it's sentimental value or, or whatever. So I'm going to work the image anyway. We're, we're going to do it. Uh, first of all, let's just have a little look at the, the file itself. I'm going to go back to my Windows Explorer. This is the start file, and I'm just going to have a look at its properties just to see what happened. Okay, so here I can see that the information about the camera, we were perfectly good for camera, um, f7.1, 60 to the second, ISO 200. So the photographer's done a lot of right things. They've 
pushed up the ISO because they're in a, a low light situation. It looks like the fa flash might have fired, but my guess is what happened is maybe it was an off-camera flash that didn't trigger, or something's gone wrong. Something has gone wrong with your, your camera setup that caused this shot not to get the correct exposure for whatever reason. I think the photographer was in the right lines. It's certainly got, or she's got the, uh, the settings right for off-camera flash or uh, flash photography. It just didn't happen. So what can we do? Well, first thing we can do is to try and fix it. Now, we might be tempted to use levels, but there's a histogram that doesn't inspire confidence. And even if we try and bring it up, well, that's where we get to what the photographer did and, and what they sent me through. So there's got to be a better way of fixing it than that, or at least getting the best out of it. And there is. It's RAW. So just like before, I'm going to bring my image into Adobe Camera Raw, either by going to File and Open As, or using Lightroom, or using the, the filter Camera Raw there. Now inside of Camera Raw, there's a nice little button that says Auto. Now Auto is a great little button for just speeding up the workflow a bit. Clicking Auto will analyze the picture and try and make it better. So when I click on Auto, it does, well, as good a job as it can, bearing in mind that we are starting with a picture that is five stops underexposed and possibly even more, that's as far as we can go. Now even if this was a raw file, and I've only been sent a JPEG, so I hope there's a raw file out there somewhere, even on a raw file, th this is too much to end up with a usable picture. But, you know, as I say, this could be a sentimental picture. I'm looking at a flag there thinking maybe American Embassy or some embassy, some, it just has that feeling, doesn't it, the ambassador's ball, maybe some Ferrero Rocher floating around somewhere. So what about the picture itself? Well, let's have a close look. Uh, as you would imagine, ISO 2000, five stops underexposed, there is a lot of noise in this shot. Now, RAW has a very good noise reduction ability. In fact, it's, it's possibly the best out there with a few exceptions of some real high-end complicated stuff. But on this kind of thing, RAW noise reduction is where I would turn because I can turn up my luminance noise reduction and just smooth out some of that graininess. Okay? Bearing in mind, we're never going to get a picture that looks like it was correctly exposed. We're doing the best we can. There's a lot of colored blotches on here as well. That's color noise. So again, we can increase the color noise and we can very quickly remove those. Now what we're left with is still a pretty crappy picture, but it's better than it was before. And as I said previously, that might just be the picture of your life, the one and only shot that you had, something that is hugely sentimental. One last little tip I'm going to give you is if you've got a color cast like this, and I don't think any kind of adjustment here is going to make a big difference because it's just, just so far off being a usable shot. Um, quick and easy technique is to do what I used to do back in my film days. When we shot high ISO film, we'd always shoot black and white because that's what was available. So uh, and it's really good at disguising noise. So a quick reduction in, in saturation, maybe a, a boost in contrast. I'd love to push the exposure even more, but I can't. Uh, might just help to reduce the noise even further. Uh, so there we go, photographer. I hope that helps, and I hope you, you had another picture where the flash did indeed fire. OK, we've got time for just one more. Uh, if you have any questions, again, remember to pop them in the chat pod, and James is there ready and waiting for you. Uh, but we're going to finish off with this one here. Let me read out the, the question, which is, uh, and it was a question sent through rather than an image question. Uh, when I set my camera to shoot in black and white, my JPEGs come out in black and white, but why are my RAW files in color? OK, so let's open this one up. So I, I did a little experiment. I've, I've practiced and played with this in the past. So if you set your camera, your DSLR, to shoot uh, both JPEGs and RAWs, and on the back of your camera you choose one of the styles Many, many cameras have styles. For example, black and white is a style I can dial in on my Canon camera. The picture on the back of your camera is black and white when you take the picture. The JPEG that you open when you get into Photoshop is black and white. But the RAW file is still color. Now, a couple of things are going on there. First of all, the back of your camera is showing you a JPEG, always. 
Okay, and that's a great example of why it's a JPEG that you're seeing, and why sometimes when you look at the back of the camera, it's a mile away from the image you see when you open up a RAW file, because it's a JPEG, it's been processed. Now, if you shoot and edit in some proprietary software, for exam example, Canon's um, DPP software, when you open your RAW file, it will honor that black and white. But if you shoot in Photoshop, or edit in Photoshop, or edit in Lightroom, or edit in Elements, when you open the same RAW file, it opens in color. Because it is indeed a RAW file with no processing done, or at least very, very minimal processing. And it doesn't honor your request to make it black and white. That's a really good thing. You see, your camera can do black and white, but you, you can do black and white much, much better, much better. So let's have a, a couple of looks at black and white here. We had a, a brief look at black and white in the uh, the previous one where we were pulling up the, the exposure on the, uh, the shot that was a little underexposed. Now, if you have elements, my quick and dirty black and white method is this. Simply take your saturation away, go to your contrast and push it up and make any other changes that you want to, for example, recover highlights and, and shadows. So no saturation, lots of contrast, and of course, wow, look, we're 25 minutes into this, and I've just touched clarity. <laughs> is, that, is that a record? That might be a record. Okay, so a little bit of clarity in there as well. Okay, so let's just open that up as a copy. So we now have two versions. So that's what the camera did, just by using the camera's black and white option. But with a few seconds in RAW, I'm able to get an image that has a lot more punch and contrast and is a lot more pleasing. Now, if you have the, the Photoshop version of RAW or Lightroom, wow, you're really made up when it comes to black and white because there's some wonderful black and white effects you can do if you have the full version of Photoshop or Lightroom 4, Lightroom 5. So first things first, make a few basic adjustments, bring back the highlights, open up the shadows, uh, I was obviously put some clarity into the picture, goes without saying. There is no point touching vibrance and saturation at all. Forget it. Don't, don't even bother with those because what we're going to do is we're going to jump over to the HSL stroke grayscale. And then I'm going to convert to grayscale by clicking the button. Now when I convert to grayscale, I get a, a black and white image very similar to the one that was created by the camera. Except if I jump back to my, my basic tab here, here's why I said don't touch vibrance and saturation. If you click on grayscale, there is no vibrance, there is no saturation, they are removed from your options. Now, this is a great way of working because it allows you to play around with these sliders to change things like the sky, which is blue, and I can just affect the blues in the picture. But there's an even better way of doing it, and it's using the targeted adjustment tool. Now, I did a whole webinar on this for the image file, so um, go back, check the, out the, the archives, and you'll find a whole half an hour webinar on grayscale and so on, and, and ways to go black and white. Um, I'm just going to use the grayscale mix, and what it does is it gives me a little target tool here, and anything I click on, I can now change. So, for example, I click and drag up and down on the sky, and the blues change, because the sky is blue. Okay, I can do the same with the trees. What color are trees? Yep, trees are green. So when I click on the trees, my greens move. But have a look at that right-hand side panel. Actually, they're not green. I mean, they are green, but they're also green with a hint of yellow. So if you want to change the trees, you drag on the trees, and the greens and the yellows change equally. Okay, so it analyzes what was under the cursor, what color, and changes the appropriate sliders. So, for example, the arches here, I think, were kind of an orangey color. Yeah, they're orange with a hint of yellow. So I can really tweak up my colors very, very accurately by using this tool without having to try and second guess what was in there in the first place. Love that tool. Okay, so we've got a nice kind of almost infrared feel with this shot, which is good. Now, I've got about a minute left before we finish, so I'm going to give you one last little tip on black and white. That's to jump back to the the basic tab, and play with the color balance. Yep, you heard me right. I know it's black and white, but here's another thing you can't do if you photograph grayscale in your camera, black and white in your camera. 
you can't change the color temperature. Now, back in the days of film, I used to put colored filters in front of my lens when I was shooting with black and white film because it affects the contrast and tonality of your black and white images. Now, I can do the same thing by tweaking the color balance. So if I tweak the tint, I can tweak it so it's a much redder picture, which is one of the colors we used to use. Or I can bring up my, my temperature and put a sort of yellowy tint in there, and I can tweak my white balance to affect my black and white image. And it seems counterintuitive, but it really does work. OK, so let's go with something like that. Uh, maybe, actually, we could possibly even give it a nice kind of, there we go, we'll drop the clarity down for that nice kind of infrared haze, rather nice. Open up the image, and we'll have a little look. So my camera wanted to give me that. Using Elements, I could produce that. Using Photoshop RAW or Lightroom RAW, I can produce that. So that's why your RAW files are in color, because they are the RAW unedited file. And that's why it's a fantastic thing, because you've got control, and you're able to create your own black and white interpretation, rather than being fixed into the one that the camera gave you. So there we go. Another Fix My Photo session is done. Uh, four great questions and four great sets of pictures. If you've got your own pictures that you'd like to send across, then please do. I'll be back here again in two weeks doing it all over again. Now, I don't know if there are any questions, but if there are, I will happily answer them. There certainly are. Gavin, thank you very much. Another great webinar. I'm sure everyone will agree. I'm certainly getting some emails coming through. Um, Hi Gavin, shooting a week uh, a wedding this weekend at Eastwell Manor. The tips are useful. Thanks a million. Uh, great webinar. Thanks Gavin. Thanks guys. Uh, I was use I use a shadow highlight filter, but will still struggle with a burnt out wedding dress. Any tricks you can recommend? I think we've done that yeah. on a previous webinar. But Gavin, any tips? Mm -hmm. We, we certainly, uh, have, if we haven't covered it before, I'd be very surprised. Okay, so um, the shadows highlight filter is underneath the image adjustments and shadows and highlights. Let's just go find a, a wedding shot here. Um, if your wedding dress is burnt out, and let's just deliberately burn out the whites like, like so, where you have no detail on the dress at all, uh, if you go to image adjustments, shadows and highlights, it will allow you to recover a little bit of shadow detail, uh, sorry, highlight detail, but basically, if you've blown the highlights, you've blown the image. Now, please do yourself a favor, shoot in, in RAW, or at least RAW and JPEG, because in RAW, there's a lot more highlight detail available to you than there is in JPEGs. In JPEGs, it's gone. It, there isn't any there. In RAW, there's more than you can actually see in the picture on screen. So first of all, shoot in RAW. Uh, secondly, slightly underexposed. If you're shooting in JPEG only, slightly underexposed so you keep the detail in the highlights because you can pull out detail from the shadows much better. But the bottom line is, if it really is gone and you're shooting JPEG, there isn't anything more you can do to recover it. Perfect. Oh, brilliantly helpful answer. But well, that's no, it, 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 it all helps. We, we've also, um, we now know who, I'm not mentioning any names, but you now know who, you know, the very dark picture. Well, this, this is the description that came through. The little guy in the middle with his eyes closed is the Irish president. So now we know. Okay, thank you very on. much. Uh, I've got a couple of queries. Which version of Photoshop did Align Layers arrive in? Do you know? Um, I would suggest it was CS2 or CS3. Okay, so it's been out a while. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, not, it's not a new feature at all. Okay. Uh, with the very dark image, are you able to save... Oh, okay, I, I see what it is. With the very dark image, if you saved that image with the plus five stops, could you then open it again and rework it to make it brighter? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so this was the, uh, for example, that one has had that effect applied. I could indeed, yeah, that's a very good point. I could go back in and reapply it, but the trouble is, every time you're doing it, you're compounding and compounding. So sure. yeah, in theory, that would be 10 stops brighter, but of course, there isn't 10 stops of data there for me to go and uh, play with. It just just isn't there, sadly. Yeah. So the answer is yes, but I, I, I don't think it would have helped. Perfect. 
Um, and the last one, I, oh, uh, how about a sweepstakes on when Gavin first mentions clarity? <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and there's lots of, there's lots of, yes, at least you're guaranteed someone to win. Um, yeah. And there's lots of thanks coming through. So Gavin, thank you very much. Remember, if you've got an image that you want Gavin to have a look at, send it through fixaphoto at theimagefile.com. Please include some details of what you're looking to achieve. We've had quite a few come through where there's been just no description of what it is, which makes it a bit tricky for Gavin because he doesn't know whether he's going to be insulting you or not. Um, so please give some details. If you have got the RAW, include the RAW. Otherwise, obviously, the JPEG file. Gavin, thank you very much. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Cheers for now. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.